Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to LEAD, Leading Equity and Diversity. I'm Debbie Willis, pronouns she, her, and hers, and I lead the DEI certificate program here at the University of Michigan's Rackham Graduate School. We started this series because scholars wanted to hear from real people their experiences leading diversity, equity, and social justice efforts. Thank you all for joining us today. Given all this going on in the world right now, we appreciate your presence. Before we get started, please note that you can enable closed captioning, live closed captioning by clicking the CC button on your screen. Though your audio and video are muted, we encourage you to engage in the conversation through the question and answer portal. We'd love to bring your voices into the conversation. If you see a question that interests you, please like or upvote that question as we will ask the questions with the broadest interest first. Before submitting your question, we ask that you can consider how your words might impact others. We also ask that you remain patient with us. As hundreds of you are joining us today and we have received many questions from registration. We will not get to them all in one hour. However, we are committed to continue these conversations and have dedicated this lead webinar series to address racial equity for an entire year. And we invite you to join us each month. Today's conversation will address chief diversity officers as anti-racism advocates. As given the events of the last year, the role of diversity, I mean, chief diversity officer has taken an even greater importance and at least greater visibility. We have two phenomenal guests to help us lead this conversation, Dr. Robert Sellers and Dr. Katrina Wade Godin. Let's start with brief introductions. Katrina, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey as a leader and advocate in the space of equity, inclusion, and social justice. Absolutely, Debbie. And first, let me say thank you for um, you and your team for cultivating this space and opportunity to talk about these very important issues. And um, so just to give you a little bit of context in terms of how I arrived to uh, my role currently, uh, my interest and my work in the area really started for me as a first year student right here at the University of Michigan. And, you know, coming to the University of Michigan from a primarily, um, well, my, well, I won't even say primarily, all uh, Black context <laughs> um, in terms of school environment, a family environment, church in environment, et cetera coming to the U of M was a bit of a culture shock. And so in being in that, um, you know, kind of a primarily African-American environment really insulated uh, me. And so being exposed to, um, you know, uh, slights in classes, uncomfortable and insensitive interactions with peers really sparked my interest into how can I be a change advocate? or a change agent um, in helping to resolve some of these issues. I had um, a prior experience in research uh, during high school. So I sought out a research opportunity. And at that time, it was very fortuitous in that the undergraduate research opportunity program was in its inaugural year. And so I was able to be a part of that program. And as a result, joined the Michigan Student Study um, as a first year student. And that was a study really around examining the uh, student experiences with and perceptions of diversity at the university. And during the early 90s, um, late 80s, early 90s, it was a time where the university was um, entertaining its kind of first soiree into um, this work uh, with the Michigan mandate. And so, <clears throat> Being a part of the Michigan uh, student study was a really rewarding experience. And I stayed with that uh, study for many years through its role in supporting the university um, in its uh, defense of the um, and, uh, affirmative action policies and advocating for the educational benefits of diversity before the Supreme Court. So it was really rewarding to be a part of that uh, team advancing those arguments. 
So fast forward a couple years, um, and now I'm in a PhD program, and I'm more and more interested in the emergence of formalized structures all around the country to support um, the evolving, what was then diversity work, right? It was, um, cause there's a continuum in terms of, you know, first it's diversity work and then it evolved to DNI and now we're at DE and I, right? But um, being interested in that, I joined forces um, with another individual who worked in the Office of Academic Multicultural Initiatives again here at the university. And uh, his, his name was Damon Williams. He's a former CDO um, for the University of Wisconsin. And, um, and he's uh, currently the CEO of the Center for Strategic Diversity Leadership and Social Innovation. But we joined forces um, at a, you know, a, a young age. And um, we were really, we set out to do a really ambitious thing. And that was to launch a research study with no money <laughs> and no resources. We just knew we had some skill sets that we could bring to bear. We could not have known that we would have 800 institutions respond to our survey that gave us some insight nationally around the structure, the priorities, and um, uh, their change management processes as it relates to the chief diversity officer role. Well, fast forward a couple of years, that research resulted in a book, uh, The Chief Diversity Officer, Strategy, Structure, and Change Management. And so um, really engagement in that work really catapulted my interest in terms of studying these structures more formally and being a part of the change equation. And it was really just fortunate that by the time the book was uh, published and uh, was being circulated, U of M was really thinking about engaging in um, its own DEI strategic plan. So enter my wonderful boss, <laughs> Dr. Robert Sellers. And um, uh, he linked in and um, thought it'd be a great uh, contribution or my efforts would be a great contribution. And so I was brought on uh, into the team and I serve as the deputy chief diversity officer. So those are some of the key insights that kind of um, are key milestones in my journey to where I am now currently. Thank you so much, Rob. So I, in some ways my uh, journey overlaps. Uh, unfortunately, I came a little bit earlier to the University of Michigan uh, uh, than Katrina in the um, mid 80s. Uh, so I was uh, here as a graduate student in the mid 80s. Um, my journey actually goes back a little further in the sense that uh, I, the, the son of two um, parents who were um, what, what one might call social activists, uh, I don't know that they would call themselves that, but they were um, uh, community activists, uh, father as a minister, my mother as a uh, nurse who went on to found a community uh, health center in uh, uh, the West End in Cincinnati. Um, and just growing up in an environment and a space recognizing um, racism, uh, other inequalities in the world, uh, a sense of purpose, a uh, sense of duty to um, uh, battle those uh, forms of oppression wherever you can, um, on uh, just uh, some of the lessons that they instilled throughout my life. And so I've tried uh, going from a graduate student in psychology, uh, and one of the ironies there is at the time uh, being involved in the uh, BAM UCAR um, uh, actions, uh, my first uh, experience in the uh, Regents Room in uh, Fleming was uh, during a sit-in. Uh, and uh, part of the demands that came out of those actions uh, resulted in what is now in many ways my current position. So it was at the time the Vice Provost for uh, Minority Affairs with Charles Moody, then uh, uh, became the Senior Vice Provost uh, for just about everything uh, with Lester Montz uh, to its uh, present incarnation um, almost 35 years ago, almost 35 years ago, 
uh, uh, into the uh, chief diversity officer and, and vice provost. Thank you. Thank you so much for the history. Um, and you all have been with us for a while through all of these different roles. So it's, it's exciting to hear that. And I can attest to the chief diversity officer, the book. It's a great book. Uh, so the first question we have is anti-racism has gained a lot of visibility in the past year. How has your work as chief diversity officer changed in response to the racial uprising and inequities exposed because of the pandemic? You want to start, Katrina? Uh, sure. Um, you know, for me, <clears throat> what it does is that um, it really crystallizes really important focal areas in our work. I think, though, in a central way, we see anti-racism work as an integral component of our efforts to be diverse, equitable, and inclusive. So, you know, simply put, we can't be a racist organization and be a diverse, equitable, and inclusive space at the same time. So, you know, even as I look at the drill down um, across our uh, five-year plan, the 2,500 plus action items, many of those action items, um, if you were to categorize them, can be firmly categorized as anti-racist or anti-racism work. And so it's really important that we see this work as not um, tangential or on the periphery, but it really is central to what we're doing. And in many ways, as you reflect upon what's happening in the national um, context or the national discourse, what's happening is that the, um, in many ways, the E just might be elevated if you think about D, E, and I, right? So earlier in my comments, I talked about the progression. So back in like the 1980s and 90s, we're talking about diversity and diversity, which was primarily focused on increasing the numeric representation of per, uh, predominantly uh, brown and black folks in, in spaces. And then we moved to DNI, um, diversity and inclusion with the understanding that just bringing diverse others to a space is not enough. We have to cultivate environments that are conducive um, to their being in the space. And most, um, you know, and, and more recently, the incorporation of the E. Um, and Michigan has really been out front in terms of really uh, committing to equity being a critical component of that um, construct. Uh, because even as you look nationally, many places it's still just the DNI and their, the um, actions and the programmatic efforts align in that way. So I think it just has quickened. Um, and amplified our, our commitment to build out environments where, um, where um, all people, you know, especially, you know, in our current context, individuals from underrepresented backgrounds have equal treatment and equal opportunity and that everybody can really thrive and grow in our environment. So it's really just um, crystallized the work around the equity, equity component, I would say. Thank you. Did you want to add, Rob? Um, the, the one thing I would add is that uh, clearly what's happened is uh, the events this summer, well, this, the events this winter and summer uh, over the past year have really elevated uh, uh, issues with regards to structural racism, uh, inequalities across the uh, broad spectrum of uh, uh, social identities in the society. Um, and a lot of people got woke for a minute. Uh, and, um, and a lot of institutions, uh, including this one, uh, uh, decided that it wanted to uh, really focus its attention with regards to anti-racist work, um, it, which has meant I, we, we've probably spent the, the last year less focusing on raising awareness in, in lots of cases and really trying to make sure that the kinds of actions that we do fit in with uh, understanding that uh, racism didn't uh, start with the killing um, of George Floyd 
or Breonna Taylor. Uh, uh, it it uh, and it it's not and it didn't stop with them either. And that uh, if we really are serious about making the kind of institutional change that will be needed and the structural change that needed, then it can't just be one off uh, programs and initiatives. It's important to react. Um, uh, it's important uh, to be responsive, um, but it can't be uh, tokenizing. And so I think much of our work has been focused in making sure that these uh, actions are also integrated into a, a longer range view of institutional change. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that. I appreciate especially the it can't be one off. I think we just yeah. have to keep focusing on continuing the conversation. Yeah. So Rob, we are pleased to see that President Biden reversed Trump's executive order barring anti-racist training. How has federal mandates affected DEI training or the need for DEI content for you? Well, so one of the things that I'm uh, happy about is the work that uh, this larger uh, U of M community has been doing, particularly over the last five years in the context of the DEI. Uh, but uh, so one of our responses as an institution was that uh, we signed on to a uh, order or to a, a lawsuit challenging um, uh, ex-President Trump's uh, executive order. Um, and as an institution, uh, our effort was to continue the work that we have been doing uh, in the past, and um, that uh, the notion that uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion work and uh, training work, while we would try to be, um, we wouldn't go looking for trouble, uh, at the same point in time, there was no way that we were going to let uh, these initiatives um, uh, keep us from doing uh, what we see as the most important uh, work at the university. Great. So the next question we have, often we, when we talk about anti-racism, it becomes conflated with anti-Blackness. How do we help people understand that anti-racism work is for everyone and that anti-Blackness work is not trying to diminish or minimize the oppression of other groups? Yeah, um, I, I'll start on this one, uh, Rob. You know, when I hear that question, um, and it comes up rather often, uh, Debbie, mm -hmm. my, my thought goes to an MLK quote, right? It's like, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, um, right. but there's a corollary. So injustice to anyone or any group is injustice to everyone and every group, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's really foundational for me as I, I think about that. And I, I, ref, I even reflect on the work needed to address much of the anti-racism being felt by our Asian American, Asian brothers and sisters, you know? So it's important to know that work in this space is anti-racism work across the board. While at the same time, we need to be mindful to the fact that when you look at the um, various indicators across racial ethnic groups, African Americans, are, African Americans are faring the least well across any number of indicators. And being, and literally put, um, are being killed in the streets by um, police officers so or by law enforcement. So I think what it does, it, it just points up in some ways a greater challenge and hence a prioritization of that work in some ways for um, anti-black racism work, but it does not at all diminish the, the need and the, the, uh, the necessity to really engage in uh, dismantling these systems for all groups. Did you wanna add Rob? Yeah, I would, I, 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 I would just echo uh, what Katrina said, and she uh, said it probably better than I can. The one, my one fear in this position and in the work that we do is not opposition um, uh, from other folks. It's division mm -hmm. within us. Uh, uh, 
too often we are taught to think in the context of a zero sum game with a small piece of pie and uh, different groups fighting over a small slice of a pie and any in, um, advancement uh, or any focus on uh, another group is somehow a diminished focus on us. And that is absolutely not the way that the, the um, uh, real struggle is. Uh, and the only way that we're going to, again, dismantle structural oppression mm -hmm. in all of its forms, it's all linked, is to be able to address it across all of its uh, manifestations and not to see them as competing, but again, as um, Katrina said, as I battle in this space, I'm also moving forward in that space and vice versa. Thank you. The next question, what are some of the strategies to support students who encounter racism in this remote environment? How can CDOs help minimize harm and foster a sense of belonging in this virtual space? Oh, that's a very good question. I'll, <laughs> if I jump in on that one. Um, uh, I, I am deeply worried not only about the impact of racism, I'm deeply worried about the impact of um, the social isolation mm -hmm. that we as uh, individuals and a society are facing over the past year. Mm -hmm. So as a psychologist, I'm particularly concerned about this in terms of uh, what is not only the short term, but also the long term consequences. So a major important um, uh, source of resilience uh, is social support, and the ability to connect with other people and be with other people. And if you look at traditional um, forms of support, uh, particularly for uh, people of color, but other uh, minoritized uh, groups, uh, is often the collective being together, whether it's church or whether it's family, whether it's extended uh, family, broader uh, social networks. And so experiencing discrimination in the context where one doesn't have that social support puts folks at the greatest uh, level of um, risk. And so I'm deeply concerned about that. Uh, and uh, so one thing uh, that uh, we're trying to do is to, again, find ways to uh, create senses of community uh, in this uh, program being an uh, outstanding example of that a place where people can share experiences, can um, trade strategies to address um, uh, experiences of discrimination and other forms of inequality, uh, to have people uh, who understand uh, their experience and can uh, help relate and uh, sometimes give us the uh, check to find out, well, was that really discrimination or was that me? And sometimes mm -hmm. it's both. Uh, you were both discriminated and you did something wrong too. But um, uh, we need that, and particularly from a developmental standpoint. So I worry again for our students who uh, a major part of uh, the college experience is developing those networks and understanding who you are in that larger context, not only as a function of uh, your formal classwork, but often more importantly, in terms of how you interact with other students. And so any way that we can find to, I guess, first, try to eliminate discrimination to the best of our abilities where we can um, uh, is important. And then second, to try to find ways to create communities that um, uh, allow us to develop the kinds of uh, resilience and thriving uh, necessary. Thank you. So higher education has a history of covering things up or claiming ignorance when they are really just looking the other way. As CDOs, how are you ensuring that reports of discrimination, harassment, or other forms of inequitable treatment are being addressed? 
So I'll, I'll start on, on that one, uh, Debbie. And it, this is such a critically important um, matter at this time yeah. um, at institutions across the country, but also at our very institution um, as a result of some, some recent events that mm -hmm. we've endured as a community. Um, and I will say, you know, in a foundational way that this is, this like many other areas is an area for continued improvement. And um, I think some of the keystone things that we're doing is to continue to work with campus partners like our um, Division of Student Life, the Office of Institutional Equity, and then also the various um, schools, colleges, and units to develop the appropriate systems where number one, individuals know where they need to go to report, Mm -hmm. um, I, there's been a major amount of work um, that went into our uh, uh, climate concerns um, of a group on campus to, again, make sure individual community members know where, they're need, know where they need to go. And also in terms of refining and optimizing processes for when someone reports incidents of harassment and discrimination. Um, uh, just being very clear about the channels that one needs to engage. And another critically important part of this is education. So um, for those who may not know, the university did some mandatory training around sexual um, uh, and gender-based misconduct last year. And that was, um, our goal was 100% of the university uh, faculty and staff uh, taking that training and we got very near I think it was 96 or 97 percent to that so I think those things in combination really help to set the foundation for how we we want to do better and will do better in terms of cultivating a culture where people know where to go um, to report concerns and to uh, get those instances of discrimination and um, inequitable treatment addressed. So speaking of the climate culture, um, the university-wide climate survey found racial disparities in terms of perceived climate on campus among staff. What have we done to determine why these disparities exist and what is the university's plan to address them? Oftentimes we collect these surveys and we don't do anything with the results um, to address the concerns. So the, um, one of the things that we, we uh, uh, wanted to do with the uh, surveys in particular was to um, make sure that the units uh, played a significant role in addressing their particular climate. Because oftentimes when you talk to staff, uh, the issue uh, often plays out within their own particular units. A number of units utilized uh, the reports and uh, they were uh, encouraged to uh, analyze the reports, work with uh, staff to uh, develop um, uh, practices and initiatives within their um, uh, particular units to uh, make a difference. Uh, at the university level, um, uh, a number of things have, have come from this. Uh, one of them uh, was the uh, development of a uh, staff ombuds person. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the university had had an ombuds person um, for faculty and for students, but as all too often is the case, staff's voices have uh, traditionally been uh, overlooked. And um, uh, uh, Jackie Bowman is our uh, staff on buds person who has made a tremendous difference being a voice that uh, is a, a voice that uh, people can come to to um, understand what their options are within the university, a voice that is neutral, uh, but it, by being neutral is often inherently supportive. Um, uh, given that many of the other uh, issues that uh, often end up in terms of uh, grievances and uh, other spaces are decidedly not 
experienced as neutral and are not. They have a, a point of view in which to, to play. So that has been an, uh, an important um, uh, set of uh, initiatives. Uh, we've also, uh, in different spaces, have looked to uh, develop uh, opportunities around um, professional development and advancement. Uh, so there's been uh, a lot of conversations in uh, HR around looking at um, uh, our current situation and how to move forward. And those uh, conversations uh, are still ongoing and in fact are um, being driven in large part by our um, coalition. Uh, uh, the coalition of uh, staff of color organizations. Um, uh, and I uh, don't want to get ahead of uh, uh, the process, but I'm uh, very excited about um, uh, where we're headed uh, with regards to those conversations and uh, larger university-wide efforts in the staff space to uh, directly address issues of staff inequality with regards to race. And I would just jump in just to add, um, you know, just to really lift up the work that's happening in the units. Uh, and, you know, we know staff, as Rob suggested, is often, um, you know, the last constituency in, in many ways. And I just want to lift up the wonderful work that's happening across the, the, the DEI strategic planning units in terms of creating really innovative opportunities for um, for staff in particular. I reflect on um, some of the activities that are taking place even in, I, I'm in the, pro, we're in the provost office, the provost office and uh, programming in our office, um, you know, that's been launched by our DEI leads. It's called DEI Alive. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a space where we come together once a month to really share and learn and reflect and build community. And you know, it moves us out of this space of staff just putting their nose down and getting the work done, but really to explore staff as individuals and to really appreciate the many offerings that they bring to our community. Um, but then also adding, you know, there are a number of units who are taking on um, a critically important work. Even you know, for example, there are a number of units. Um, who are engaging in works to better examine equity, salary equity issues um, at the university. So I just want to just lift up the idea that we're addressing this work in a central way, but in many ways, the important, the most important work is happening at the unit level and, you know, where, um, where the plans actually reside. And so just wanted to spotlight that. Yeah, so a couple of things I'd have to say, um, the staff absolutely appreciate the, the addition of the staff ombudsman. And I agree, you know, Jackie Bowman has done a phenomenal job. I would be remiss not to say that she's one of my favorite people on the, on the earth. So um, we appreciate that. And it was absolutely needed for staff. And also the collaborative effort of people all over campus, like you were saying, Katrina, the DEI leads, but also engaging other people and other ideas. So you can do this in a way that's innovative and that they're passionate about. People are passionate about their thing and then they're more likely to do it and get buy-in from it. So I appreciate um, that as well and I appreciate all the DEI implementation leads and working with them um, on University of Michigan's campus is, is such a pleasure. Now speaking of the efforts of uh, DEI leaders, DEI and anti-racist efforts are prominently, show, prominently shouldered by women of color who are doing this work on top of regular job duties and therefore voluntary and unpaid. Many refer to this as an invisible tax. How are we or should we be rewarding and compensating those who do DEI work on campus and make sure it's more equitably distributed? As some leaders have promoted this work as reward in and of itself. You want to start, Rob? Sure. 
So I'm a I'm a bit of two minds with regards to this. So I would agree a thousand percent that um, uh, African American women have uh, historically been uh, the backbones with regards to the movement. Now that doesn't mean that African American men have been absent, uh, but I think African American women have not uh, uh, gotten the the credit, the due for the work that they've done and continue to do. Um, uh, throughout. Um, uh, we've worked hard to try to uh, do two things, to make this work more visible um, uh, and doing so by um, uh, uh, working to encourage to make sure that um, uh, the, the work that's being done is acknowledged uh, as part of annual review processes and other spaces. Uh, we have more full-time DEI uh, diversity leads than, other, than any other uh, university that I'm aware of. So um, uh, that's also another space in terms of the formal space. Uh, we've uh, worked to ensure that there's recognition uh, of the work, whether it's the Harold Johnson Award, the um, Distinguished Diversity Leadership Awards, the James Jackson Award, um, uh, throughout the uh, University Distinguished, uh, or sorry, University Diversity and Social Transformation uh, Professorships, numerous uh, awards that uh, say that this, this work is valuable and valued. And in those, we uh, try to make them as um, prestigious as uh, possible. Um, and, um, uh, and I think that that's important and that, that more of that uh, needs to happen as well. The other side of this is the unfortunate fact, and I always come back to my Frederick Douglass, the limits of oppression will always be set by the oppressed, always has been, always will be. Um, uh, you never, at least that I'm aware of in history, have a situation where uh, the relaxation of oppression is done by those who are doing the oppressing without uh, a push from the oppressed. Uh, so uh, we will always have to do the work, whether the work is uh, paid or not, whether the work is recognized or not, if we are to move forward. Now, it's my job uh, uh, and our job to try to push to make sure that there are institutional uh, support for the work where it is. Uh, but uh, the other side of that um, uh, uh, tells me that that can't be the determinant as to whether or not we push to continue to do the work. The folks that came before us that allowed us to have this opportunity pushed with even less with regards to support, uh, et cetera. And our goal is to push to make sure that those who come after us have even more than what we do in, in moving forward. And that part of that legacy uh, must also uh, continue. So uh, it's a both and uh, proposition um, and uh, we continue uh, to, to work at it. Thank you. So I'm going to bring in a question from our participants. Um, it's a statement, then a question. <laughs> it says, it would seem that when engaging with racially and ethically diverse populations, the risk of unintentional harm due to the types of questions we ask, the responses we give, or any other aspect of our engagement is high, and that we could conduct our research we need to ensure we have that we are being of service to justice. The question, with that in mind, do you think it's important for doctoral students and postdoctoral research fellows conducting research with racially and ethically diverse populations receive additional in-depth training addressing implicit racial biases? And if so, how might we encourage U of M and other universities to do this? So I would just jump in to say that um, I think that's just, that's good practice. You know, like if we are, if we are in the, in the role of building out an understanding of a phenomena or a group, 
um, that we carry a level of sensitivity and um, knowledge and familiarity with that group. So I think those types of training opportunities are valuable, not just for postdocs or um, you know, other, other individuals um, in that space. So you know, that is something I think that can add um, great value for sure. Yeah, and I, I would say um, from my perspective, as a um, scholar who, uh, whose career is focused on studying the role of race in the lives of African-Americans, um, I don't believe you can study somebody if you don't know them. Uh, and it's important that uh, we all have some understanding of the folks that we actually are studying, particularly um, those of us who are uh, doing work where, where our work defines the reality of the people with whom we're working. Uh, and uh, so I think it should be a requirement that, um, uh, and I don't think it's just racial bias. I think it's, you know, you can't say that you understand the experiences of uh, Asian American women um, uh, and you don't, the only Asian American women you know are your graduate student and the uh, uh, one colleague in your off, in your um, department. Um, that if you're really going to do this work and understand the breadth of diversity of experiences that one has to actually get to know folks, which means that one has to venture into waters where one may say the, the wrong thing. Uh, and one will have to learn uh, uh, how to uh, interact effectively, respectfully um, uh, with people that are, are different from us. Uh, it is uh, a skill that many people uh, from, again, traditionally minoritized groups learn all the time. Uh, and so it's a skill that we all should uh, uh, be working at. And it should be worked at both in formal ways, whether it's through programs like uh, IGR or uh, some of the, the training programs uh, that our, uh, organizational learning is providing, um, um, but it also has to happen uh, in informal ways. And some of those informal ways uh, are going to be painful uh, across uh, in both spaces. But if we're really talking about um, creating a environment and creating individuals who are competent to uh, study or provide services to a community, they have to see and experience that community as human and not as different. Great. I'll bring in another question from the participants. Um, many graduate students have been frustrated with the lack of progress in the long term, as you alluded to. Specifically, they found many trainings like the DEI certificate program and resources helpful, but I've seen very little progress on changes to the university policing and other measures of accountability, and the roadmap is less clear at this point. What would you suggest that graduate students can do to move institutions like the University of Michigan in substantial ways besides participating occasionally in DEI seminars? So you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, start here. Um, you know, it is, you know, as I reflect on, you know, the nature of the challenges around this work, right? It's this idea that, um, or, or this, this perceived lack, or the existence of a lack of a sense of agency in affecting the change equation, you know? So um, knowing that, so be absolutely beyond the, the dialogues, beyond participate in periodic trainings, we have to ask ourselves, what can we do as individuals, you know, to impact our personal relationships, our, um, you know, things that are occurring within our uh, neighborhoods or environments close to us in our community and here at the university. So it has to be, has to be a pivot towards, um, towards action. 
And I think that, um, you know, from a, from a graduate student um, perspective, mm -hmm. that um, there are a number of different ways to engage. So, you know, there are various graduate student organizations um, that you can be a part of. I know SCORE there in, in Rackham, mm -hmm. um, you know, just in, in, embedded in the work of advancing understanding, knowledge, familiarity around these issues. Um, being able to partner with faculty in very meaningful ways. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that is happening across campus. What I fear is that not a lot of the, the good work that's happening with either in with graduate students solely or in partnership with faculty or other uh, campus partners is not highlighted. So I think a lot of good work is going on. I just think that um, I know for, I shouldn't say, I think I know a lot of good work is going on, um, just given our vantage point. Um, but it's, it's just familiarizing yourself as a student, whether that's undergrad or graduate, in just what actually is occurring before making the assumption that nothing is happening, because that it has not been proven true in many spaces. Yeah, I, I want to sort of second that. So, you know, Einstein is absolutely right. Time is rel relative. Um, uh, and uh, now that I've gotten old, it, it, it uh, rings even more true in terms of, I think uh, it, it's important not to be discouraged. And one way not to be discouraged is to think about the, uh, your work in um, a broader context. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've always uh, thought it's important to think about uh, ourselves as links and change in chains. Um, that uh, the best piece of advice I got in taking this position, uh, one of the best pieces from Charles Moody, the first uh, person in this, was. Uh, it took the University of Michigan 200 years uh, <laughs> to get to be like this. And it ain't gonna change overnight, no matter what you do. Uh, uh, it's gonna take time and it's gonna take uh, uh, piecemeal, brick by brick by brick to uh, uh, make those changes. And the reality is none of us, none of us on this Zoom is going to be here the day that the University of Michigan becomes completely diverse, equitable, and inclusive. It just, I, I don't know that anybody that is born, that it will be completely diverse, equitable, and inclusive, and there won't be work that'll be done. As long as there's a University of Michigan, there'll be work that is done. Mm -hmm. And as long as there's a United States of America, there'll be work that needs to be done. And as long as there's an earth, there'll be work that is needed to be done. But within that, also uh, being able to be definitive in the nature of the contributions that you uh, wanna make. First, it's important to understand what your role here as graduate students, and uh, I'm assuming, and I don't wanna make that assu assumption, but I'm gonna do it anyway, that you're uh, um, a uh, person of a traditionally uh, minoritized group, or at least you care enough about that to, to, to write the question. Yeah. Uh, but you have, in my mind, two responsibilities. That's the way I was raised. One, you have a responsibility to make sure that you leave here making the University of Michigan a better place than it was uh, for folks like you um, than what it was when you got here. Uh, and in ways, hopefully, that will, will signal change. Um, uh, and those ways aren't going to be that you're going to change the University of Michigan and end discrimination in the University of Michigan or end um, uh, structural racism, sexism, homophobia uh, in the University of Michigan. Um, it's not, not going to be an open access uh, university uh, in your time here. Uh, but you can make differences in your own space. You can make sure that your department is opened up 
uh, with regards to uh, its admissions process by recruiting other people uh, from your community, working with your faculty in your departments to uh, make changes in the way in which they uh, uh, work with and view graduate students, um, uh, particularly uh, traditionally underrepresented graduate students. Um, and, and those changes make a difference because that's the next uh, uh, person that comes in and keeps the door open a little bit more for two more people and four more people and 10 more people. Uh, and not only do they make a difference in Michigan, but for those of you who are graduate students in particular, they're gonna make a difference in your field because mm -hmm. uh, you can't make a difference in your field um, um, uh, by yourself with one or two. Which gets me to the second point. Then I'll I'll shut up. I'm now I'm now in preaching mode. And that's um, to understand that the University of Michigan is just one stop. Your job was not to completely fix the University of Michigan. Your job was to get a degree here, make it a better place, and then go be successful, and then go to the next place and make it a little bit better. That's how we as a people have been able to move forward and to survive, and not only survive, but thrive uh, through all kinds of forms of oppression. And if you're able to do that, then you will be successful. And ultimately, the University of Michigan will be successful because it will also provide more opportunities to folks that didn't because you're here. So don't always think that it's going to be one big thing that's gonna make the change. Oftentimes, small things make all kinds of changes. And I'll give you one small example of that. I'm sorry, I know I was gonna shut up, but I couldn't help it. So uh, basically, SCORE is a small example of that where there were uh, six folks in a room after a party that decided that there needed to be uh, a uh, organization that addressed um, uh, uh, graduate students of color. That was 40, almost 30 something years ago, 1986. Um, uh, and it's still alive and it's still around and it's still making a difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, All right, I'm going to bring it. Oh, go ahead, Katrina. I, you know, I just want to, since we're in this graduate student space, I just want to um, present one thing. And that's because I've worked with a variety of different graduate students over the years. And I just want to make sure that it's centered. And Rob, you spoke a little bit to this, what your role is in terms of being here and getting your degree because we have benefited from the work of a lot of graduate students as it relates you know, to the um, DEI space. But many of those individuals left this institution without a degree. And so just really centering the fact that you are here to, to get a degree and to be able to use that as a vehicle and a tool to further um, enhance the environments as Rob, Rob alluded to. So don't it, it, it requires just navigating the balance, mm -hmm. being committed to this work, but scaling it in a way that you are still attentive to your priority of being a student and getting what you need to have done. Because that's been the most, one of the most disheartening things that I've observed yeah. um, over my time here at the university. And then just, um, just uh, uh, underscoring again, this opportunity the idea that one person can make an incredible difference. One of the individuals that worked with me made a very impactful difference in her school as it related to the number of um, underrepresented students coming through. And so you can affect change. Right. Okay. We have to get to um, at least two more questions from the participants because they've been upvoted uh, and we have six minutes. So in the culture change, in culture change work, it is vital to have policy realignment, processes, updates, resource allocation, people info data, culture and human behavior change, all happening simultaneously, long lasting change occurs. Can you please talk more about the policy and infrastructure change you're proposing on working on to create a stronghold of DEI as an integral part of U of M? 
me or, or, or Katrina? Uh, doesn't matter. How about so, you start, Rob? So I'm actually trying to figure out how many. So the first one I would say is actually the DEI strategic plan. The fact that, A, we're all sitting here talking about DEI and we know what DEI means, that we're all doing this is something different. B, that we have 50, so I'm talking fast because uh, I have a lot to say, but I want to say it short. <laughs> you got uh, a, a structure, not volunteers, but a structure, radical change where you got 50 DEI leads, well, actually uh, closer to uh, 200 DEI leads um, uh, uh, that are embedded in the structure. DEI is part of the budget process. So when you start talking about uh, resources, so it's been linked to perhaps the most important accountability structure that we have at the university, uh, which is the actual um, uh, but it's budget uh, structure. We've had numerous uh, uh, changes with regards to policies, uh, everything from um, uh, the, the having DEI work be counted as part of the annual review process. And some uh, schools and colleges are working towards having it as part of the um, uh, promotion and tenure process for uh, faculty to have it embedded into uh, hiring practices and uh, changing um, uh, training uh, with respect to that, uh, uh, having the um, 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 Oh, I just lost my thought, uh, but uh, 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 having numerous kinds of changes where uh, it's part of the hiring process with regards to university leaders. So um, uh, both uh, search committees and ultimate um, uh, university leaders now meet with uh, a representative of my office, usually myself, as a fundamental part of the um, search process. Um, the inclusive teaching initiatives, uh, where every school and college has a faculty member who uh, is part of a um, uh, community working on developing more inclusive teaching techniques to be able to train uh, other faculty and other um, uh, GSIs uh, on how to be more effective teachers uh, with the support of um, uh, CRLT. Numerous non quote unquote diversity related units having at its center a diversity uh, commitment and focus, whether it's CRLT or uh, academic innovations, um, uh, as just two larger uh, examples of service units where DEI is not uh, necessarily should be, a, uh, I shouldn't say should be, would not necessarily be seen as part of their mission. It is fundamentally written into what they do. The work at Rackham, if nothing else, the, the work at Rackham, uh, uh, very few places have uh, a Debbie Willis uh, 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 there. Very, very few places not only have um, a Debbie uh, Willis, but an Ethan Bram, uh, Brammer, all the many other people working as fundamentally a part of what they do is DEI in support of graduate students. So um, I'm, uh, again, think there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Uh, but across each of those uh, different points, I'm very proud of the work that's being done by the larger university community. Because the other thing that Dr. Moody said is don't let them make DEI be all about you. If they're not going to give you everybody else's uh, paycheck, then don't do everybody else's work. Make it everybody else's, make it everybody's work. Yeah. So I'll shut up there. <laughs> yeah, that just highlights this idea that point leadership, while important, um, it can't be the only thing. You know, at a unit level or even in, in central position, everyone has to pull the wagon and unit leadership sets the tone. Absolutely. So with that, I'll say, um, unfortunately, the hour always goes so fast. 
So, but it's one o'clock and I want to um, stay within our time. So I greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate you, Rob and Katrina. I know everything that's going on. I don't even know half of the things, but I know a lot of things that you're going, um, that you're working on right now. So I appreciate you taking this hour with us today. I will say in the chat, lots of graduate students were very thankful for the time you spent um, talking about graduate students and talking directly to graduate students. So I greatly appreciate that as well. I just want to thank all of our guests who joined us today, all like, um, for the for the whole time, we appreciate you being here. I want to appreciate Dean Michael Solomon, the Dean of Rackham Graduate School. As you say, Rob, um, Rackham Graduate School is very deeply committed to this equity work. And, you know, like you said, Katrina, it starts with the leader. And so I am like very appreciative of that. And I want to invite everyone to join us. Well, we saved these questions, like some of the questions that came in today were um, phenomenal questions. And I we will try to get to them um, eventually. So I'll let you know that. Next month, we have Dr. Daphne Watkins um, of University of Michigan and Dr. John Wallace of Pittsburgh, but he used to be um, at University of Michigan. And they are they will be talking about how universities can work their efforts towards racial equity in the community. And they're both like phenomenal um, examples of that. So we hope that you enjoy, we will join us there. Lastly, all of our webinars are on our, our lead webinar playlist that are on the rack on YouTube list. So you can revisit those there. With that, thank you everyone for joining us today and we'll see you next month, March 12th. Bye everyone. Thank you.